Welcome to this lesson in the medical terminology series and today we're thinking about the gastrointestinal system. Now when I say gastrointestinal I mean all of the digestive system from the mouth all the way through to the anus but technically gastro means stomach and intestinal means relating to the intestines. But gastrointestinal to me means the GI system which is absolutely everything from the mouth to the anus. Now what I try and do in these talks is give you examples that we actually come across in our day-to-day -day nursing and medical practice as opposed to anything obscure. So the terms I'm talking about here are terms that I'll use on a daily basis at work. Well here we have some of the major components of the gastrointestinal system. Do feel free to freeze frame and peruse this at your leisure. So in this lesson we want to progressively work through the regions and components of the gastrointestinal system. So we're going to start with the mouth and oral means pertaining to the mouth. The word oral or the term oral actually comes from the Latin oralis which actually means face or to do with speech but it's come to mean mouth. So when we use the term oral, we mean to do with the mouth. So for example, a medication be may be given PO, per oral. That means given via the mouth and usually intimates that that medication would be swallowed. Or you might come across oral candidiasis, which is a fungal infection in the mouth, often referred to as thrush because of the speckled appearance it can have. And oral cancers are relatively common, unfortunately, caused by such things as smoking and, in Asia, chewing betel nut juice. Now, stomat or stomato is also relating to the mouth. Now, oral is Latin, derived from the Latin, whereas the Greek for mouth is stoma. So that's where we get the term stomat or stomato from. So, for example, stromatitis is inflammation of the mouth. Stromat, here is the prefix, meaning mouth, and I-T-I-S, the suffix, always means inflammation of. In practice, actually, we probably talk about glossitis or gingivitis, more specifically, whereas stromatitis is a generalised term, whereas glossitis is specific to inflammation of the tongue, Gingivitis is specific to inflammation of the gums. And stromatalgia, A-L-G-I-A, -A, on the end of the word, algia means pain. So stromatalgia is anything that causes a painful mouth. It's really describing a symptom. The patient will say, I have a painful mouth, and that is stromatalgia. Now, gloss and lingu are both terms meaning the tongue. And again, it's Latin and Greek here. So glossa is Greek for tongue, whereas lingu is Latin for tongue. So glossal just means pertaining to the tongue. Glossitis would be inflammation of the tongue. And lingual is also pertaining to the tongue. For example, sublingual would be under the tongue. So if a patient has chest pain, we will often give sublingual glycerine trinitrate because it's absorbed much more quickly under the tongue than it would be if the medication was swallowed. Now the pharynx is actually this tube at the back connecting the nose, the back of the mouth and the top of the esophagus. So the nasopharynx is the component of the pharynx behind the nose. The oropharynx is the length of the pharynx behind the mouth and the laryngopharynx is down there near the larynx which of course contains the vocal cords and that goes straight on down to the esophagus. And the um, laryngopharynx is separated from the trachea by the epiglottis. Pharyngo denotes the pharynx. And pharynx is actually the Greek word for throat. So a pharyngoscope is an instrument for viewing the pharynx. 
pharyngitis is inflammation of the pharynx. Now, unfortunately, esophagus is one of those words that's spelt differently in English English and American English. Um, it's spelt with an E in American English and an O in English English. But don't worry, we both agree it's a muscular tube which extends from the laryngopharynx down through the chest. Now, the word actually derives from uh, two Greek words. Oseo means to carry, O-I-S-O. And phage means um, to eat. So it's carrying, eating or carrying food. Because um, the P-H-A-G, phage, relates to feeding, such as phagocytosis. So actually, uh, we both spell it wrong because it should be spelled O-I-S-O. -S but the more American phonetic spelling actually does make a lot more sense. So, for example, in English, we talk about gourd, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And in US medicine, it would be GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So esophophage means relating to the esophagus. So esophageal is pertaining to the esophagus. So if there was veins in the esophagus which were varicosed, we'd talk about esophageal varices. Or if there was inflammation of the esophagus, we'd talk about esophagitis. And a fairly dramatic surgical procedure, an esophagectomy would be surgical removal of the esophagus. Now in this model, we see the intestines. Firstly, the small intestine or the small bowel. And secondly, the large intestine or the large bowel or the colon. And the difference really is the diameter. The small bowel has a more narrow diameter, whereas the large intestine, the colon, is wider. And in this model, the small intestine is in pink and the large intestine is in a grey colour. Now I'm considering this slide next because entero is a fairly generic type of term. Now, enteron is actually Greek for intestine, but we tend to use enteric in the context of anything to do with the gastrointestinal tract. So, for example, uh, an enteric fever is a fever which has arisen as a result of an infection in the gastrointestinal tract, such as typhoid. Gastroenteritis. Gastro means stomach. Enter is intestine, itis is inflammation of. So gastroenteritis technically is inflammation of the stomach and the intestines. And gastroenteritis can be caused by microorganisms such as bacteria or viruses. Enteritis just means inflammation of the intestine. Anything that causes inflammation. And one we use quite often in hospital practice is uh, enteral feed. So an enteral feed means food going into the gastrointestinal tract. Now, any time you eat a sandwich, then you are enterally feeding because the food is going into the gastrointestinal tract. But what we tend to mean is the patient, for example, might have a nasogastric tube and we're feeding them directly into the stomach. And we call this the enteral feed, the feed which goes into the gastrointestinal tract. So enteral here means via the GI, via the gastrointestinal tract. Whereas parenteral, par, means beside. So parenteral really means not via the GI tract. So an enterally administered drug would be given via the gastrointestinal tract. If it was parenteral, it might be given intravenously or intramuscularly or subcutaneously. And that would be parenteral, not via the gastrointestinal tract. Now we're moving on to the stomach. Now the stomach is this hollow muscular structure. Food comes from the esophagus into the stomach. And here we have a cut open stomach and we notice that the top part is called the fundus. The middle part is called the body and this lower part is called the pylorus. And from the pylorus, food will go through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum and the top part of the duodenum there I've labelled with a D.
Now gastro means related to the stomach. And this comes from the Greek gaster, which is the Greek word for stomach. So gastroesophageal would mean relating to the stomach and the esophagus. So we mentioned gastroesophageal reflux. Reflux means something is going backwards. It's not the direction it's supposed to go, it's going backwards. So food is supposed to go from the esophagus into the stomach. If it goes from the stomach back into the esophagus, that would be reflux. And that's what often gives us that heartburn, dyspepsia type feeling. Gastritis is inflammation of the stomach. Now this can be infective if it's caused by a virus or bacteria, as might occur in types of food poisoning. Or gastritis can also be non-infective, caused by a physical irritation of the stomach lining, as might be caused by consuming alcohol, for example. Now, ostomy means an artificial or a surgical opening. So gastrostomy would be an artificial opening into the stomach. Ectomy means surgical removal of. So gastrectomy would be a removal of the stomach via a surgical procedure. And gastroparesis would be a weakness of the stomach. Now this can occur as a complication of diabetes, where there is an autonomic neuropathy, leading to reduced muscular activity and peristaltic activity in the stomach, a gastroparesis. Now after partly digested material leaves the stomach via the pyloric sphincter, it goes into the first section of the small intestine, and that's called the duodenum. And today we normally take that as about the first 25 centimetres of the small intestine. And we notice that halfway through the duodenum, the bile duct and the pancreatic duct both empty their secretions into the duodenum to assist with digestive processes. Now our modern term duodenum comes from the Latin duodeni. Duo is two. Deni is 10, so that adds up to 12. Because originally, if you put 12 fingers together, that's both hands and then another two fingers, that would be the length of the duodenum. That's where it comes from. It means the first 12 finger widths of the small intestine. So duodenal just means pertaining to the duodenum. Duodenal ulcers, for example, are ulcers which occur within the duodenum, often caused by the presence of Helicobacter pylori bacterium. Now the jejunum is the second part of the small intestine, the first part being the duodenum and the distal or the latter part being the ileum. So relating to the jejunum. So, jejunoraphy would be a surgical repair or suturing of the duodenum. A nasojejunal is a term you might come across. Now, if a patient's got pancreatitis, we want to feed them, but we don't want to stimulate the release of digestive enzymes from the pancreas. So, sometimes we'll fit a nasojejunal tube, a tube which goes from the nose all the way through the stomach, through the duodenum, and the end lodges in the jejunum. Now ilia is Latin for intestine, but we use the term ilium to describe the latter part or the distal portion of the small intestine. And we see that the ilium here connects to the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine via the ileocecal valve. Now ilia is Latin for intestines in general, but we use the term ilio to relate specifically to the ileum, the distal portion of the small intestine. So the ileum is between the jejunum and the cecum of the large intestine or the colon. So ileitis is inflammation of the ileum. 
iliocecal is relating to the ilium and the cecum. So the iliocecal valve is the valve between the ilium and the cecum, which is the first part of the colon or the large intestine. Now an ostomy is an artificial or surgical opening. So an ileostomy is where the surgeon brings out the ilium onto the abdominal wall, bypassing the colon. So that means that faecal material does not pass from the ilium into the colon, but will pass from the ilium onto the outside of the body where it's normally collected in a bag. So an ileostomy. So if there's a total colectomy, for example, if the whole colon is removed, then there's no choice but to put the ilium on the outside of the body, forming an ileostomy. So we've said that ilio relates specifically to the ilium, but we also said that uh, ilia is actually Latin for all of the intestine. And there's a medical term, a paralytic ileus. And paralytic means paralysis. So, for example, sometimes post-operatively or after peritonitis, the gastrointestinal tract will stop working. It will be paralysed for a period of time. And this refers to the whole tract. A paralytic ileus means that the gastrointestinal tract is not functioning. It is not contractile for a period of time. And this does relate to the whole intestine if we use it in this context of paralytic ileus, referring to all of the intestines. Well, I've included here a quick review of the components of the colon, if you want to remind yourself. Now, col or colo is relating to the colon, the large intestine. And this actually derives from the Greek for colon, which is colon, with a K, K-O-L-O-N, but we spell it with a C. So ulcerative colitis, inflammation and ulceration of the colon. Colostomy, an artificial opening. So if the colon is taken and the opening of the colon is made on the abdominal wall, then the faecal material can be collected externally in a colostomy bag. Colectomy would be surgical removal of the colon. So sometimes after a partial colectomy, a colostomy would be formed. And coliforms are bacteria which normally live in the colon, which of course is good. We're supposed to have normal flora in the colon. It gives many health advantages. But if coliforms, for example, get into the urinary tract, that will cause urinary tract infection with coliforms the bacteria that we would normally expect only to be in the colon. Now the sigmoid colon is that portion of the colon which travels posteriorly. So the descending colon travels down the left side of the abdomen, descends down the left side of the abdomen, and it's reasonably anterior, but then to get to the rectum it's got to go backwards, it's got to go posteriorly. And this is a C-shaped section, so it's connecting the descending colon with the rectum. So sigmoiditis would be inflammation of the sigmoid section of the colon. Sigmoidoscopy would be to visualise the sigmoid section of the colon. And sigmoidectomy would be a surgical removal of the sigmoid colon. Now, the term sigmoid is actually derived from the Greek letter sigma. And when sigma was written in Greek by hand, it had a C-shape. So sigma-shaped is actually C-shaped, hence the sigmoid or C-shaped portion of the colon. Now, here we see the last part of the gastrointestinal tract, the distal sigmoid. Fecal material from the distal sigmoid will go through into the rectum. And it's actually the stretching of the rectum which stimulates the desire to empty the bowel and to defecate. And the rectum would store the fecal material for a short period of time normally before it is expelled through the anus. And we notice that the rectum is relatively straight. And rectus actually means straight. So this is where the rectum gets its name from. 
it's the straight part of the colon. So you might think of rectus muscles in the abdomen or the eye, which are straight muscles because rectus means straight. So rect or recto is relating to the rectum, pertaining to the rectum. So a rectal prolapse would be where the rectum prolapses out, starts falling out of where the anal orifice would normally be. And you're left with an inverted piece of rectum protruding. Or rectal varices, not a term we normally use, but that describes them accurately. Varicose veins in the rectum that we normally call hemorrhoids. Or piles, of course. Now, slight overlap here again on this, the last slide in this lesson. Proct or procto denoting the rectum or the anus. And proctos is actually the Greek word for anus. But we use it to mean the rectum or the anus. So a proctoscope would be a device to visualise the anus and the rectum. Well, a relatively common clinical feature that patients report to us is proctalgia pain in the area of the rectum. It's a symptom, of course, and we need to derive or work out what is actually causing this pain. Hemorrhoids is quite a common cause of proctalgia, as well as itchiness. Well, that's the end of this lesson on medical terminology relating to the gastrointestinal tract. But there are quite a lot of other videos relating to other aspects of medical terminology on the playlist related to medical terminology.